there's a few things happening that make me think that these isolated examples, uh, isolated examples might become less so uh, very soon. And the first of those is the data that's being collected right now is in fact getting bigger. Um, by way of scale, in the last two years, we've collected almost as much data as in the entirety of human history leading up to that. You guys describe this as the nervous system for the planet. What do you mean? Well, a lot of us think that we're, all of us with our smartphones and our Google searches and all the things we're doing in the course of our day, that we're watching this sort of growth of a planetary brain. Imagine if you touched your finger to the stove, but you didn't know you'd burnt it for a week. Yeah. Now we have this real-time feedback loop that the human race has never had before. If you're looking at the world of data, you're looking at the world of information. That's almost everything that isn't physical. The industrial world is the physical world. The data world is everything else. And it affects every one of us every day. We're all being predicted. Do you think people understand how much of our lives are being collected? What, what else do we not know? We're now collecting exabytes and petabytes of data. And we're looking through that data set using incredibly powerful algorithms to see what we would never see before. Every powerful tool has a dark side. Every last one. I think that McKinsey report also said that the Internet of Things will be a market that was bigger than the entire uh, economy um, of the world. But it's fair to ask companies, as they build out the Internet of Things, to not be creepy. The Internet of Things is referring to this, uh, all these gadgets. Everything being connected. Yeah. Most people don't have any understanding of the scope of this stuff. Now, my background's in IT, specifically IT security. But as an example, it turns out in the US, just to give you an example, and only 14% of people understand that their web surfing history is being tracked. Now for me, that's a little bit like discovering that 86% of the United States population still believe in the Easter Bunny. It's a little terrifying because it means that the conversations we're having here today put us all in an extraordinarily elite group in understanding the potential damages. Most people just don't know. We are now more surveilled than we have ever been. Cities are covered in CCTV cameras. Authorities are gathering data on its citizens. It would be all too easy to confuse the real world with a sci-fi dystopia. And I wonder, with big data, everything is becoming more and more targeted because you have more and more information about consumers. I think that's exactly now, right. I think that uh, what we're seeing today is that we can use predictive analytics to know a lot about the people that we're targeting. In the movie Minority Reports, the pre-crimes unit race to arrest would-be offenders before they have a chance to commit their crimes. Now, they use psychics, but it turns out something similar is being attempted using big data. The Vancouver Police Department is the first police agency in Canada to implement predictive policing technology. And that information can turn a city into a digital world, allowing officers to essentially predict crime. Okay, Jad, what's coming? Double homicide, one male, one female, killer's male. But some of this technology is proving to be controversial, especially this. It's called the Strategic Subjects List, where Hunch Lab is concerned with predicting crimes and locations. This list is concerned with predicting crimes and individual people. Well, interestingly, earlier this week I spoke to DJ Patil. Now, until recently, he was President Obama's chief data scientist. I asked him about this, this is what he said. I have a many, many deep concerns about the process of these things. The fundamental one is the transparency of the algorithm. And so what was interesting is that, of course, when we are looking more specifically at automation and algorithms and the questions around it, of course there are many difficulties in identifying how, in many different cases, where automation and algorithms are actually used and take place. And one of the most frustrating things I found during the course of preparing this study that will hopefully come out sometime this year and for which I'm the rapporteur, the fact of automation is very frequently, in my experience, uh, lied about or is not acknowledged the amount of automation and the amount of automated decision making that takes place within society. And so one of the things that we found is that we're surrounded by quasi-automated decision making, situations like the one that I'm mentioning where the decisions are basically made by computers but by current legal standards wouldn't be considered as such because somewhere at some small process there was a human being in the loop so we can pretend to ourselves that everything's okay we're not surrounded by automation and the world is a wonderful place 
Now, of course, that's not true. When you start looking at these things in greater detail, you realize there's, there's no reason to, to justify that. Yet still, this is a, an issue that we increasingly face, both defining the scope and the size of what we're going to be looking at. Because I think you need to start acknowledging that automation and automated uh, decision-making procedures are far more prevalent in society than we previously, as scholars, as policymakers, as people within society, been willing to acknowledge. Yeah. So is any country, uh, other country to use the predictive technology for this? Um, we're the first in Canada. There is some predictive technology down in the United States. It's a different system. We've developed our own here in Vancouver that works for our city. Korean police officers will soon implement AI technology to prevent crimes from happening and automatically track down criminals. I don't know, they might be approached if they seem suspicious without any kind of good reason. So that would be my concern, is just like creating a culture of surveillance. Violent crime in Chicago has seen a dramatic increase. The response from Chicago's police department is a new initiative driven by technology which aims to predict where crimes are likely to occur. I think if someone had walked up to you 10 years ago and said, um, could I plant a little device on you that would tell me who you've spoken to today, what you're curious about, what books you've read, <laughs> what money you would have spent, you, you would have said, are you kidding? There's no way right. in hell I'd let anybody put a device like that on me. And now we line up and sleep in front of the Apple store for two days to pay $800 yeah. because it's so convenient. Uh, what is your take on the Chinese government publicly ramping up its efforts in AI? This is a clear directive coming from the top ranks of the Chinese government saying we want to be the global leader in this area. Alibaba's new store, Tao Cafe, is now open in the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou. Customers scan a QR code from their phones when they walk out. When they leave, facial recognition technology identifies the customer and their accounts are automatically charged. The new generation of artificial intelligence technology is rapidly penetrating into all walks of society and transforming every part of the economy. I think we live in a world now where highly sensitive information are all over the place. They are accessible to a large number of actors um, without our knowledge or consent. We are surrounded by vulnerable connected devices and networks. Um, and the last point is uh, our, our interaction, our very intimate lives are increasingly shaped by decisions that are made by inherently opaque artificial intelligence. The store is part of a new artificial intelligence town in Hangzhou. We are not going to make a store that everyone is already familiar with. The truth is, the cafe needs to be redefined. Supermarkets need to be redefined. The next thing is that big data can personalize everything. Uh, this I talked a little bit in my last book, but it turns out that it's coming true in lots of ways that I hadn't necessarily expected. So. Um, my son Jesse is 10 years old, and uh, I've been working on this project for the last year and a half, and he often wanders in the kitchen late at night after the kids have gone to bed and I'm sitting there working, and he came in a few months ago and he said, Dad, every time you're on the phone, you're always saying this thing, big data. What, what is big data? And I was thinking, this is like the ultimate challenge. How do you explain? I mean, I'm still trying to understand what it is, and how do you explain to a 10-year-old what big data is? So I, I was struggling for an analogy. I said, Jesse, um, imagine if your whole life you've been looking through one eye and all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, scientists enabled you to open up another eye. 
So what you're not getting is just, it's not just more vision, it's not more data, it's a different dimension. You're seeing things that were there, but you couldn't see them before until you had that second perspective. And so, of course, being 10 years old, he said, so, like, could, could scientists let me open up a third eye and a fourth and a thousand eyes? Like, if you're 10 years old, a thousand eyes is so cool. And I said, yeah, actually, that is exactly what's happening. You can take literally a thousand different sets of data and find patterns in them that we've never been able to perceive before. And it's really like different dimensions. It's actually quite hard to grasp. Also raises concerns about privacy. Could you be giving up too much of yours with a simple wave of your hand? ...to implant chips like these in the hands of volunteers among its workforce. It is vying to become the first company in the U.S. to microchip employees. The summit's right out of 1984, but Jamie Yukas found willing workers in 2017. Do you think this is the future? It is the future. You don't get one side without the other. When there's a new tool, it can be used for good or evil. You know, what the employees who have signed up say, it's just convenient. You know, the, the, the idea is you just wave your hand. And designed to replace the traditional keypad for opening doors, using the copier, even buying food in the cafeteria. To be able to purchase it. But what if there was a way that you wouldn't have to do any of that? It sounds, <laughs> it sounds a bit like a plot point in a dystopian novel. Right, that whole, I know it's very futuristic, I get it. But I think, what's wrong with just taking out your card? But good for them. I think Go it's the, the wave curve. of the future that we'll all have implanted chips that have our medical records. The question now is, is what do we do from here? And, um, and the answer, I think, is that we do what we are doing here now. We talk to each other, we try and figure out how to get other people to talk about it, and we try and get society at large to recognize that this is a critical issue. Now there's, I think, a, a really critical timeline on all of this. Right now, only about one third of the planet is online. So that's us and a few other people. The remaining two thirds, however, are coming online in the next five to 15 years, which is an, an incredibly short period of time.